John Hagee is a televangelist who's been around for a long, long time. And somehow the dude has completely slipped under my radar. Well, he popped up on my radar recently for some interesting stuff he said. So let's take a look at a couple of historical clips, see what he had to say. This one's from October 2014. Then we'll look at his more modern clips from just the other day. In this clip, he's talking to his son, Matthew Hagee, who's on the left. John Hagee is on the right. So let's give this a watch and see what he had to say. I want every American to hear this very clearly. The prophet Joel says in the third chapter, I, God, will bring all nations, and hear that phrase, all nations includes America. Uh-oh, we're starting to get political. Into judgment. For they have divided up my land, the land of Israel. Okay, he's one of those people. So, seems to me like he's leaning heavily into the the whole Israel issue. Here's the thing about televangelists and their love for Israel. If it was altruistic or if it was humanitarian or something, it'd be one thing. It's not. The thing about televangelists in Israel is they need Israel to exist as a country for the end to come in Christians' eyes. That's part of the prophecy. They believe the Bible says that Israel will be rebuilt, and if it ceases to exist, or if it isn't prospering or something, the end can't come. That's the whole bit. And what happens when the end comes? Israel is destroyed, of course, because they're not Christians. This isn't about humanitarianism. They do not care about Israel. They don't care about the Jewish people. In fact, a lot of them have deep problems with the Jewish people. They just needed to exist for their prophecy to come true. That is their only interest in Israel. God says when any nation divides up the land of Israel, they are subject to judgment. Okay, is, is that Old Testament? Is that talking about modern day? Or is that some very specific quote from some very specific guy in a very specific situation? I, I, I don't even know what verse he's talking about here. And dividing Jerusalem is dividing the land. Okay, and, and what does he mean by dividing Israel? At this point, this is 2014, Obama was president, and, spoiler alert, he absolutely hated Obama. Obama was not splitting up Israel in any sense of the term. Our president is, is dead set on dividing Jerusalem. No. Obama was president at the time. In no way was Obama interested in dividing up Israel. Remember, this all routes back to his belief in this end times prophecy. The end can't come unless Israel exists. God is watching, and he will bring America into judgment. There are grounds to say judgment has already begun because he, the president, has been fighting to divide Jerusalem for years now. How? What was Obama doing up to 2014 that was dividing Israel, quote-unquote. But didn't Obama give them Iron Dome or something? Like, when did Iron Dome go... Hang on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obama gave Israel Iron Dome or funded Iron Dome or something like that in 2011. In what way was Obama trying to divide Israel? Is it because he wasn't giving them the level of support that you wanted him to give them? What? We are now experiencing... The crisis of Ebola. Oh, wow, dude. He fell right into the Ebola craze of 2014. Oh, my God. So, obviously, the guy dives deep into culture war issues. That's the point here. The guy eats it up hook, line, and sinker. He will believe pretty much anything the Republican Party had to say at that time. For those of you who are just getting involved in politics or just got involved in, like, 2016 when Trump got elected or whatever, it's always been pretty bad. It's always been pretty ridiculous like this. I mean, this is a new level, obviously. It's a new level. We have people storming the Capitol, trying to break in and kidnap the senators and, and the House members and stuff. It, it is a new level, but it's always been hyperbolic and unhinged. Fox News has always been about scaring people. Nothing more. We have a crisis in our economy. We are worried on every hand that we're going to be attacked by radical Islam 
and there are some very rational voices saying that's their ne we are their next target. What rational voices? This is weasel words right here. I've talked about weasel words a, a little while back. Here's the definition of weasel words. A weasel word or an anonymous authority is an informal term for words and phrases aimed at creating an impression that something specific and meaningful has been said when in fact only a vague or ambiguous claim has been communicated. So an example would be saying something like, it's been said, or they are after me, or they are trying to kidnap people, or they are globalists. Using the amorphous, ambiguous they, this big unknown, unseen enemy that's after you all the time. It's weasel words. And that's exactly what this guy just used right here. Very rational voices. What rational voices? Whose voices? Who are you talking about? I have no reason to believe you because you're not giving me names. You're not getting specific. I can say the exact same thing. Very rational voices have said that Islam wasn't coming after the United States in 2014. How about that? Now we're on equal footing. You claim they did. I claim they didn't. Saying that's their ne we are their next target. We are a nation that has a crisis of leadership. We are in chaos. And Looking back... What a quaint thing to think, right? A crisis of leadership under Obama's presidency. Boy, was he wrong. He had no idea. He had absolutely no idea. So that's uh, a little introduction to John Hagee. He's always been involved in culture war issues. He's always used the persecution complex and fear-mongering to scare his audience. February 2016, let me give you a little bit of lead up to what was happening at the time. At this point, the election hadn't actually taken place yet. It was going to happen in November of 2016, and then Trump was going to be inaugurated January 20th of 2017. And then Trump had 2017 to 2021. That was kind of the timeline of events. So honestly, the primary may not have even happened yet. I don't think it did. We didn't know that Trump was going to be the winner. This is the moment, roughly, mid-February 2016, when Scalia died in office, like he was a Supreme Court justice, a very, very deeply conservative Supreme Court justice, like a complete wingnut kind of thing. And he died of something, heart attack maybe, I'm not sure. Anyway, Obama still had a solid year left in office. He actually had 11 months. They hadn't even picked a new president yet. He, you know, they, the votes hadn't even happened yet. The primary hadn't even happened yet. It was Obama's pick who the next president was, or who the next Supreme Court justice was going to be. And the Republican Party intentionally chose not to hold a hearing. They chose not to hold a vote on who Obama wanted to nominate as the next Supreme Court justice. He picked Merrick Garland. Merrick Garland is now the leader of the Department of Justice, I think, but they didn't even hold a hearing. They didn't even hold a hearing. So Trump wins the election, 11 months later gets inaugurated in. Neil Gorsuch was the Supreme Court nominee that Donald Trump put in office in place of Scalia. It was Obama's pick, but the Republican Party said, oh, we never pick a Supreme Court justice in the last year of a presidency. Who said that? That's never been a rule. Nobody has ever said that. It's not even a tradition. So Trump picks Neil Gorsuch, after getting put into office, Obama lost that Supreme Court pick. And then, in 2020, Ruth Bader Ginsburg dies, a liberal justice. The last, like, month or two months of Trump's presidency, she dies. And they held a hearing and pushed a new one through instantly. Breaking the supposed quote-unquote tradition that they set up. So that was the situation with the Supreme Court justices, basically. That's what this next clip is about with John Hagee. Listen to this one. Mid-February 2016, before the primaries even took place, to find out if it was going to be Donald Trump who was going to be the nominee or not. Justice Scalia's death makes this presidential election a battle for the future of this nation. He's using urgent rhetoric, like we need to do this, or the end is going to come and everything's going to crumble and America will lose and everything will fail and fall apart and all that stuff. This is how they get people to crawl over broken glass to vote for their guys. They scare the shit out of them, for lack of a better term. Anything they can do to whip you into a blood frenzy and scare you to death, they'll do it. They'll say it. The future of this nation. If the president is allowed by the Senate to appoint a Supreme Court justice, America as we know it will be lost 
forever and immediately. You know, that's obviously incredibly hyperbolic and it reminds me of when our old buddy chuck norris said we'll be plunged into a thousand years of darkness if you don't vote or if whatever thing was happening in that moment this was 2012 this was for the 2013 election which obama won our great president ronald reagan said freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction we didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream it must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. President Reagan went on to say that you and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We will preserve for our children this last best hope for man on earth, or we will sentence them to take the first step into a thousand years of darkness. Yeah, that's the famous quote, a thousand years of darkness. And then Roger Stone went on stage and said basically the exact same thing just a couple of months ago, something very similar. We have two parties in this country, the patriots and the traitors. This is not about Republican and Democrat anymore. It is about those who believe in our constitutional freedoms and are ready to fight for them. And it is those who have sold us out, those who will buckle to the machine. This is a struggle between dark and light, between good and evil, between the godly and the godless, and we dare not fail or we step off into a thousand years of darkness. Yeah, way to plagiarize a speech from Chuck Norris, who apparently plagiarized it from Ronald Reagan. Well, quoted it. I guess he quoted it. Seems like plagiarism to me from Roger Stone. But anyways, this is the kind of rhetoric that the Republican Party's been using for a while now, and it gets people really, really scared. The Democratic Party doesn't do things like this. They talk about inevitable consequences of things that could happen. Like, for example... I've been talking a lot about the fact that the Republican Party is planning on removing birth control, banning birth control. That's not fear-mongering. That's a realistic problem that we're going to face. That's something that the Republicans are talking about right now. Republicans, when they talk about this stuff, are completely disconnected from reality and say things that are beyond hyperbole. This is in no way realistic, like some of the things they believe are, are going to happen. Socialism is going to invade America? What? Communism is here? China is taking over? I, this is all nonsense. It's, it's disconnected from reality. But this is the MO of the Republican Party. This is the kind of thing that they do. They use hyperbole. They scare people to death because they know if they do that, they'll get them to the ballot box. They will crawl over broken glass to vote. The left needs that same kind of enthusiasm if we want to push evangelicals out of government. If we want to push them out of power, we need that same enthusiasm. The cheap way of getting that kind of enthusiasm is by scaring the shit out of people like they've been doing. The honest way just doesn't do it as quickly. I'm not saying we should be doing it like Republicans, scaring people. We shouldn't. We absolutely shouldn't. I'm just telling you this is why they're winning. Anyway, let's keep listening to John Hagee, fearmonger to his audience. A fifth liberal justice on the court will pass the socialist agenda of the president with lightning speed. Every person listening to this telecast should contact their senator and encourage them not to consider any candidate to replace Justice Scalia on the Supreme Court until the next president has been elected by the American people. For once, let the voice of the American people make the call, not the political establishment in Washington, D.C. Yeah, that's the kind of fear-mongering tactics the Republicans have always used. It's dirty, it's underhanded, and honestly, it shouldn't be coming from a pastor or a televangelist using his church as a platform to preach politics. I feel like that's deeply, deeply wrong. And barely constitutional, barely legal. In fact, I think I've heard a couple examples already, just in what we've listened to from John Hagee, of him crossing the line from legal speech to illegal speech that should get his tax-exempt status taken. I mean, he's not going to be jailed for anything he says as a pastor, but he, w he should legally have his tax-exempt status removed for some of the things that he said so far. This president has a master's degree in deception. Uh, I won't get started on that because this is only a 30-minute show. 
Of course, he's talking about Obama at this point. But it's also the responsibility of Senator McConnell to block the president's presentation. The, the Senate does not receive anything that McConnell does not okay. One, if McConnell does so, we call upon those senators in the U.S. Senate who want this nation to be preserved to boycott any person that the President of the United States put forward. And just as a matter of history, when the shoe was on the other foot in 1960, the Democratic Party passed a law forbidding a president in the last year of his presidency to select a Supreme Court justice. Do you hear that on Facebook, John? That's BS. I didn't hear a single word about that. I've never heard of this law. Can you tell me the name of the law? Uh, you gave me a year. Can you give me a law number? Anything at all? I've never heard of that before. That's absolute nonsense. Strange how history comes back to bite you. But why is he so worried if there's already a law banning it? If there is a law preventing Obama from picking a Supreme Court justice in his final year, then why are you worried? Why are you out here telling your audience to call their senators? Telling your church members to call their senators? Why are you even bothering if it's illegal? Because it's not. He made it up. Of course. This is the kind of thing they do. They lie, they cheat, they manipulate, they do whatever it takes to accomplish their goals. This is called an ends justify the means mentality, and it is a hallmark of extremism. This is what makes somebody an extremist, the ends justify the means mentality. You believe that it's okay to do anything at all if it accomplishes your goal. That's what differentiates Republicans from Democrats right now, in my opinion. Their willingness to fight dirty, to lie, cheat, steal, to twist facts, to gerrymander, to spread false information, whatever, anything. Lie about whatever to accomplish your goals. So anyways, yeah, that's John Hagee. I just want to give you a little bit of an idea of who the guy is before we listen to the newest clips. That brings us to today. This one is mid-May 2022, the most recent one I've got here. Listen to what he had to say to his audience the other day. What would happen if America obeyed all of the Ten Commandments? Our schools... Oh, before, before you answer that, John, why would we? They were abolished by Jesus. We would have no reason to listen to the Ten Commandments at all. You know what they were replaced with? They were replaced with two primary laws. Love your neighbor as yourself and love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, body, strength, whatever else you've got in you. I believe that Jesus replaced the old laws with that. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, somebody, if there's more to it than that. But I find it interesting that he'd rather go with the laws that condemn homosexuality than the laws that say to love everybody. Isn't that something? Our schools would be teaching the Ten Commandments, not throwing them out the back door. The schools shouldn't have anything to do with religion. There wouldn't be a critical race theory being taught. There isn't. There is no critical race theory. This is a fabrication in your own mind. Critical race theory is like a graduate level degree or a graduate level class that people in law school take. To look at political issues from a different lens is like a thought experiment, basically. They're not teaching critical race theory, quote unquote, in kindergarten. There wouldn't be a critical race theory being taught. There would be no transgender sex being taught. Uh, if trans, quote unquote, transgender sex is not being taught. There are some trans people in the world. That's a fact. And it's a fact you're not going to eliminate either. You're not going to get rid of trans people, FYI, much as you would like to try. It's not going to happen. They're here and they're here to stay. And that's just what it is, whether you like it or not. But no one is trying to teach anybody to be trans. Again, a fabrication in your own head. If the Ten Commandments were in the schools, there would not be condoms in the restrooms. Uh, there wouldn't be crime in the street, for you shall not steal. There shall not be murder, you shall not commit murder. There would be no abortions, because I assure you, in God's opinion, abortion is murder. 
Oh, and of course you speak for God, is that right? I find it interesting that he seems to believe that everybody would follow the Ten Commandments without fail. Like, there would be absolutely no issue with crime. You would just get rid of the police, who cares? Because everyone's following the Ten Commandments, right? And if they don't follow the Ten, uh, and if they don't follow the Ten Commandments, then we what? Deport them? What's your plan here, John? They they'll just follow them, I guess, is his plan. They're just gonna follow all the commandments. Period. Anyway, that's John Hagee. That's his bizarre take on the Ten Commandments and what would happen if the United States followed it. I guess we could just get rid of the police, get rid of the senators. Hell, get rid of everything. We don't need the U.S. government at all. Because everyone would just follow the Ten Commandments. That totally checks out. 100% logical right there. He released another clip mid-May 2022. Give this one a listen. The Bible is forbidden to be read in public schools. Uh, no. No, the Bible is not forbidden to be read in public schools. You are perfectly free to read the Bible in public school to your heart's content. Teachers are not allowed to force students to sit there and read the Bible, that's the difference. They're not allowed to use it as instructive material unless it's in a comparative religions class of some sort. They're not allowed to use it as a history book or something like that. Once again, twisting facts around to make people more afraid, to make people think that the world is significantly worse than it actually is because that gets people out to vote. That motivates them. That builds a sense of group loyalty and camaraderie and brotherhood. This is the persecution complex at work right here. White Christian males are so persecuted in the United States. If you only knew how persecuted they were. The Bible is forbidden to be read in public schools. Public prayers would be forbidden. The Ten Commandments were stripped from the walls of Congress and schools and universities. The fact is that every crisis America is facing can be solved by obedience to the Ten Commandments. Yeah, you know, technically I think that schools are actually allowed to put up Ten Commandments if they also allow the Satanic Temple to put up a pentagram or Muslims to put up whatever else, you know, whatever other things they want to put up. It's just schools never want to have a pentagram in the middle of their courtyard or whatever. So they have to, like, they're forced by law to take down the Ten Commandments if they aren't going to allow the Satanic Temple to come into. That's really what it's all about. And he doesn't like that. What he's fighting for here is privilege. He's fighting for Christian privilege, not fighting against Christian persecution. He is fighting for Christians to have more rights than everybody else. The fact is that every crisis America is facing can be solved by obedience to the Ten Commandments. That's not an overreach. That's a fact. Okay. Why would we follow the Ten Commandments, John? Jesus abolished those. We don't need the Ten Commandments anymore. The commandments we need are love your neighbor as yourself. Don't judge lest ye be judged. All the other ones that Jesus taught. Why are you going all the way back four or five thousand years to find old laws that the old Jewish people used to follow? 613 of them, by the way. And why are you picking the first 10? Why aren't you going with the other 603 that came after it? They weren't really separated out. Not, not really. You'd have to stop wearing cotton and linen blends. That means no polyester suits. You couldn't put two seeds in the same hole. All of the other stuff that comes with those laws, you have to take it all. You can't just take 10. That would be morally and logically consistent, though, and that's not what he's looking for. He's looking for a point of persecution. He's looking for a fear tactic, and he's looking for simple, basic, straightforward talking points that he can use to get people radicalized. It's time for 65 million Christians in America to stand up and fight back and be counted. Vote the Bible. Vote the Bible. Vote the Bible. Bring righteousness back to America. You know, it, it honestly seems to me that what he's doing here is enough to get his tax-exempt status removed. It should be. I mean, I've read the Johnson Amendment. I've read the U.S. tax code. I know the laws with this stuff, and he should have his tax-exempt status removed, just based off of what I've already heard. Let freedom ring! Can I get a witness?
It's time for 65 million people to take our Bible-based convictions and drive this godless socialist ad administration out of office. Godless? Socialist? In no stretch of the imagination is Biden's administration godless or socialist. Biden is a deep believing Catholic, and in no sense is he a socialist either, or a communist, or whatever other buzzwords you want to stick in there. Do it now. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Give the Lord praise in this house. Yeah, so that's John Hagee. That's what we're dealing with right now. And here's my question for you. How do these televangelists keep roping in these gullible suckers? How is it that he finds new people to believe the nonsense that he spouts? Look at the size of this dude's mega church. If you're not watching, if you're listening, I'm not good at crowd estimates, but I'm guessing it's, I mean, we're only looking at like a small corner here. I'm guessing it's at least 6,000 people minimum. It could be up to 10,000. It's huge. It's ginormagantuan, if you will. How did he rope in this many gullible suckers? Let me know in the comments. He actually specifically instructed his people to vote for Donald Trump. Here you go. This is John Hagee specifically instructing his people to vote for Donald Trump, which, by the way, is explicitly against the law and he should lose his tax exempt status for this. Martin Imola said to see evil and not call it evil is evil. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. God will not hold us harmless. I want you to understand that as an American citizen, you have a responsibility to go vote. I am going to vote for the candidate that's going to make the U.S. military great again because the party in power has reduced us to a World War II level where the Japanese attacked us for the very reason. Okay, this is interesting. It seems to me that I guess he didn't explicitly say, go vote for Donald Trump. He said, go vote. I'm voting for Donald Trump. If you don't vote for who God wants you to vote for, then you will burn in hell. I'm voting for Donald Trump. Go vote. I'm going to vote for the party that is going to solve the immigration problem, not the one that has created the immigration problem. I'm going to bring, I'm going to support the party that brings jobs back from China, not through international trade agree agreements, send millions of jobs to foreign countries because it's cheaper labor and putting millions of Americans out of work. I mean, this is from 2016, but I do find it particularly interesting that Biden explicitly said that he intended to try to have things made in America again, too. He said that in his State of the Union, and I think he even said that on the campaign trail. That was like one of his big things or whatever. But, you know, facts don't matter to these people. None of it matters. What matters is hurting their enemy, owning the libs, and having an ends justify the means mentality. Lie, cheat, steal, manipulate, whatever. Whatever it takes to get you where you want to be, which is a second term for Donald Trump, or a first term in this case for Donald Trump. That's who these people are.